Hi, this is Benoit, your host of the Solar Maverick Podcast. I would like to thank Summit Ridge Energy for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. As the nation's leading commercial solar company, Summit Ridge Energy merges financial innovation and industry-leading execution to deliver clean, locally generated energy. This has made Summit Ridge one of the fastest growing energy companies in America. Since launching in 2017, the company has deployed over $2 billion into clean energy assets and controls a development pipeline of more than 3 gigawatts that will provide solar power to homes and businesses nationwide. Learn more about Summit Energy at sreenergy.com and connect with them on LinkedIn. We'll also have their information in the notes of the podcast. Thank you, Summit Ridge Energy, for sponsoring this episode of the Solar Maverick Podcast. I'm not saying everyone has to be identical, but I think there should be a baseline standard for every solar project that every lender, no matter what it is, meets these minimum criteria to make sure the customer is getting what they're signing up for. It's one of the only industries there's no QC. Imagine buying a car and there's no quality control from Ford. The wheels might fall off as soon as you take it off the lot, but you won't know until you get it home. That's basically where we're at. That's how I view it. Hello and welcome to the Solar Maverick Podcast, where solar meets entrepreneurship and experience. I'm your host, Benoit Thangen, so let's get into it. Hi, this is Benoit, your host of the Solar Maverick Podcast. I'm really excited to have my co-host on several episodes of the podcast, Nate Giovanelli. He's the Chief Executive Officer at Sunrays Capital and Jason Steinberg, who's the CEO at Scanafly. And we're going to focus this podcast on talking about, you know, different trends that we're seeing in the industry as of June 20th, 2024. The reason why I'm putting a date is because things change so quickly in the industry. And thank you to you both for making time to be on the podcast. It would be great if we could start off with maybe brief introductions. Jason, if you want to start off with what your company does, and then we could go to Nate and then start talking about what we're seeing in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having us on. So Jason Steinberg, CEO of Scanafly. We are a PV design and field operations software platform. You know, we started in 2018 to solve the manual and highly cumbersome processes in the solar operations side, typically on the post-sale side. So you imagine, you know, someone goes out there for a site survey, which happens at about 90% of residential projects, and they're climbing on a roof, up a ladder, usually alone, middle of nowhere, you know, getting measurements. It could take an hour. It's a fairly dangerous process, and it produces some pretty poor data. Then an engineering person has to go in and to read through the chicken scratch and to understand what's reflected on site, to model shading. And it ultimately gets installed. And so that leads to a lot of revisions, some safety challenges. It takes a long time. And our goal was to automate that, to digitize that, and to make it a much better process. So our company has uh, contractors incorporating drones into their workflow to collect data on site, use a Scanify mobile app to collect electrical and structural data. And then they generate a nearly automatic design that's perfectly accurate that will always fit on install day. We've got other parts of the platform, like a design services effort. You can now do a remote design in our software as well. At the end, Scanafly is the operations platform when it comes to design, getting field measurements, and all the way taking it all the way to install. That's a great description. I appreciate you explaining, Jason. And you're mostly focused on residential and commercial industrial. That's you- right. Yeah, so residential, CNI, the best use case is on buildings and structures, so it can be carports and canopies as well. You can also model ground mounts in our software, but I typically recommend no larger than a couple megawatts. I think that's when the value prop starts to get reduced. But anywhere where you need to understand how it is to get good, accurate measurements so it fits on install day, um, where shading analysis is critical, where you're trying to scale your business or to maximize your current team or just make sure everyone's doing a high quality, safe job, that's where you should use our platform. Definitely. That sounds great. I think this is my... I should have counted 12, 13. I don't know how many times I've been on, but it's always good to be here and talk to my friend Benoit. And I'm really excited to have the opportunity. I've interviewed Jason before at at RE Plus as part of Suncast Media, the industry pulse. And, you know, as Benoit said, I think I don't want to go too much into my background because you can check out other episodes and I'm sure he'll put a link in the description of the podcast. But As Benoit said, I'm currently the CEO of Sunrays Capital. And basically what we're doing is building technology 
for seamless transactions and innovative funding structures in the residential solar space. Predominantly on the lease side is where we're focused right now or third-party ownership side. And I guess I would start with an anecdote is I met Jason five years ago, at least maybe longer when I was back at my former leasing company. And to this day, I still remember the presentation he gave. It was one of the best presentations that I've ever seen. At the time, they were trying to get us to approve their software for the shade analysis. Because when you think really about a lease, again, which is where my expertise lies versus a loan, in a solar lease, you can just think of it as you're underwriting the production of the system. Whereas a loan, you're underwriting the credit of the customer. Okay. So what that means is on the back end, people don't really look at loans. Like there's no real QC, you know, the big loan companies out there, the banks, they're just buying these loans. But on the lease side, for those that are familiar with solar and particularly residue solar, it's a whole different animal. I mean, we look at the projects that come through our system, we look at an average 80 photos. You know, I'd love to get that down. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about on this podcast using and leveraging new technology, like what Jason's company's built to get those photos down. But I mean, we're looking at the engineering diagrams, the as builds, making sure it all ties it out, really honing in on that shade report to make sure the system's going to produce what it says it's going to produce, following literally the line diagram the whole way through to make sure the project's wired correctly, strung correctly, that's grounded. I mean, we look at every aspect of the job. And part of what we're trying to do at Sunrays is to take some of that manualness out of it, right? Because if people that have have been longtime listeners to this podcast know that I think there's going to be a transition here from people being sold solar to buying solar. And in order to successfully do that, we need to have better technology and systems. It's so easy that a homeowner can educate themselves, understand, and then follow their project with a high level of quality because this industry doesn't have a lot of standardization. So that's a little bit about my background, how I met Jason, and I'm excited to have this conversation with you guys today. Yeah, definitely. And we'll have the notes in the podcast, like the interviews you've been on, Nate, on the Solar Maverick podcast, then the latest one, which was episode 150, where you talk about how Sunrace Capital is innovating residential solar. Just to kind of start off, can both of you talk about like the current state of the industry and what you're specifically seeing in residential solar? I know, Nate, in the pre-interview, you were talking about obviously residential solar growing every year. And this year looks like it's not going to be growing. And can you talk about like why that's the case? Sure. I guess I'll kick it off and then I'll kick it back to Jason. But yeah, I mean, as you said, since the inception of residential solar, there might've been a down quarter somewhere along the line. I have to go back and look, but holistically, you know, it's grown year over year. So if you look at Q4 of 23 versus 22, it's always grown. And I think the last two quarters are the first two down quarters in you know the last decade in the residential solar. And obviously there's a lot going on. Most people would point to interest rates, certainly makes it tough, particularly for loans. Obviously it impacts leases as well. I think that's part of the equation. Honestly, I don't think it's a lot of the equation though. I'm sure it had a factor. I think it's a little overhyped. And the reason is, I mean, you can just look at the data and the data doesn't lie. And when you look at it, you'll see that electricity rates have really outpaced interest rates and inflation. They're some of the highest. If you look at measures of inflation from consumables, like consumables are down kind of flat right now where, and we might've talked about this on the last episode and I post all this on LinkedIn. So if you want to go through my LinkedIn, you can look at it, but energy rates are really high still relative. So when you're looking at inflation, so what that means is the industry should be able to support a higher interest rate or slightly getting paid a little bit less for a lease product because that interest rate is higher. There's more saving or I'm sorry, because the energy rate is higher. There's more savings opportunity for the customer. I think some of the bigger issues are that on the installer side, I'm really curious what Jason thinks about this, but on the installer side, they already have pretty low margins. It's not a high margin business in construction, right? And back in 2020 and before a lot of installers got payments before at the sale, we'll call it. NTP payments, M1 payments for people that are in the industry, those were common. And that sort of all started to go away, you know, in that it was about the time Pink Energy went out of business. And those upfront payments went away, you know, we saw, saw a wave and we're still seeing a wave of installers go out of business. I mean, I think 
the top two have gone out this year, which was ADT who bought SunPro, and then most recently in the last week or so, Titan. So when you think about the industry on a macro level, yes, it is down. But I mean, those are just two. I could name 10 off the top of my head that were all in the probably in the top 20 that are out of business. And a lot of it comes down to that M1 payment, I think, going away. The industry is not as strong. Equipment prices are down relative to COVID, which is great. But I think it's that turbulence with the installers and everyone kind of restructuring their business model to get in line with the new payment standards. And it really forces you to run a really tight quality business. And what do you mean by payment standards? Like I said, it used to be that you would get paid something at when the project is sold. And the issue is that those have gone away. Now you get paid 100% generally, not 100%, but you get paid maybe 80% at mechanical completion and 20% when the system turns on with the utility. So what that means, if you're an installer, that's a lot of money to float, right? If you're doing a thousand jobs a month, think about that. You have all the labor, all the equipment costs, permitting, customer acquisition, which is a massive cost. All these costs that you have to shoulder until you get glass on the roof. And even once the solar panels are up, if you're only getting 80% from your financier, whether it's a loan or a lease, you're still probably underwater on that project because say their average margin is 10%. So if you're getting 80%, you still need that PTO payment permission to operate just to make money on that job. And that whole process can be you know anywhere from 120 to 180 days, depending on what your geography is. Sometimes it's faster, but you know I'd say on average, it's probably north of 120 days. Yeah, thanks for explaining. That's a huge obviously a challenge to float that. So Jason, it would be great to get your perspective as well of what you're seeing and your unique perspective too. Yeah, I started my career, I was on the install side working for small contractors. And then I spent a lot of time on the research and finance side living in these numbers. I spend a lot more of my time today though with contractors and their workflows and operations and how they navigate their projects. I definitely defer to Nate on the larger trends and the economics at this point. And I agree with everything he's saying. I do think there are some macroeconomic things going on here, right? Inflation and discretionary spending, particularly on the home, I think is inflation up, discretionary spending down. There was a large boom in COVID because of people just staring at their walls and like, how can I fix my house? My father-in-law is a bathrooms and kitchens contractor. And so we exchange these anecdotes all the time. And so I think there is a bit of a lull post that. I think we can't underscore NEM3 but also just rule changes in general, right? People are now in Illinois, but they hear they're going to be coming out of it, right? And, and it's not just the local contractors, it's every national one is, that's where they're trying to fill the downside of another market. And so it feels like the utilities are on offense right now, right? There was a Calci email that went out earlier in the week around storage rules in California and the PUC is pushing back there. We were at a panel in April that talked about Florida and M3 rules potentially coming in. So I think whenever you have an actively changing legislative and regulatory landscape that also creates uncertainty and that can slow things down. But that's the macro stuff. And, you know, I agree with Nate's perspective on that. You know, we're Scatify and myself, where I spend the majority of my time those with contractors and understanding their workflows and understanding how efficient are they and are they optimized and are they responsible when it comes to spending? You know, whenever we used to visit a contractor, we have a running list of signs that they might not be in business in a couple of years, right? How many nice cars are in their parking lot? Right? Do they have the money shooting gun machine on at quarterly celebrations? Are they posting about revenue targets at the end of a quarter? You know, are they driving around in scooters in the office? Are their workers looking like they're busy or not busy? Like you can go into a contractor's office. If it's a nice office, we had one that had a barber shop in it. Like you can tell who's being responsible about their PL and who's not. And for us, that's on the surface, right? Then we meet a contractor. We ask, you know, all right, so what's your workflow entail? What software are you using? If you see duplicative software, like two remote design softwares or a duplicative process, you know that they're not being conscious about optimizing their program, right? Therefore, they're not optimizing their resources. So I think a lot of the bankruptcies occurred last year. We tracked a lot of financial distress. I think there are more that have been announced recently. And I hope that these are more laggard situations that we're hoping to get through the first half of this year and pick up that tailwind on the selling season and the summer and I think they're realizing that that might not be playing out for them. And I believe that we're closer to the finish line on this than where we started because we're seeing contractors starting to invest again. The ones that have held strong and maybe have investors behind them or have always been a little bit slower moving or just more thoughtful or more ruthless when it comes to their expenses, we're starting to see them make investments. We're starting to see them 
open up a new office. Now is the time to invest in this technology. It feels right. And so I actually think we're going to see a, a pattern towards the quality first contractor starting to rise. I don't know if this is a long-term pattern. I'm really hopeful. I'm cautiously optimistic. There was one contractor who said to me that the 2010s were all about sales, right? It was the rise of sales orgs and remote software and LIDAR solving all shading problems and, you know, right? Like all these reasons for just sell, sell, sell. And you saw people really iron out their door-to-door pitches. And now we're seeing the result of that. And they said the 2020s will be about quality, about operations. We've learned how to optimize sales, right? Ideally, we can compress margins there more because, right, CAC is like 50% of the cost, right? So there's more to do. But I think what I'm optimistic about right now is, yes, there are headwinds and yes, there is turbulence. But I'm watching regional leading contractors double down and invest. I'm seeing long tail contractors stay true to who they've been for 10 or 20 years and it's working out. And I'm seeing quality rise. And that's really where Nate and I's platforms align, both from a values perspective and personally as people and what we want for our industry. But also that's where we're seeing the most traction and interest is people who have been doing it the right way, who want to keep going deep on tech and process and efficiency and thoughtfulness and doing right by the homeowners and the business owners and the property owners that they serve. I agree with all of Nate's comments on turbulence. I have an optimistic perspective on where we can come on the other end of this. And I'm hoping that leads to longstanding maturation for our industry. Like that's going to be the key. Can we finally grow up as a mainstay energy industry, not a cowboy solar industry, right? I'm cautiously optimistic. And I think the rise of regional leading contractors, the long tail who've been doing it for a long time, they'll be the ones to carry us there. And I hope that Nate and I's platforms can help them do that. I totally agree. I think the reason why I don't want to discount how contractors are paid, again, it is generally pretty thin margin. And there's no, unlike other like HVAC contractors, like example I use, there's no recurring revenue. You sell the job, you install it, and there's no moving parts. So there's not a whole lot to do. You never go back to that. But the other issue I think that you're seeing is, I mean, just look at the market. You can look at it today. I haven't even looked at it, but I guarantee you that the big publicly traded companies in solar are down. I think, you know, one of the large public leasing companies is down over 70% in the last 12 months, 60% year to date. The other one is down 11%. It's tough. And, you know, anyone in the market in the resi space will tell you too that they miss payments. They have long durations. So if you're not getting paid anything at the sale anymore, which I agree with, by the way, and I've been on the other end of that in a previous life where we were giving upfront payments. And the problem is if you give 60% of the job before it's built and the contractor uses that money for something else, for the money gun and the cars, which often happen, they can't dig out of that hole because their cancel rate is higher than what the upfront payment is. So they're getting all this money and then they have all these cancels. And if they don't keep that money, they can't pay it back. So that's really why those went away. But now what we're seeing is in particular, some of these large companies struggling to make payments and pay contractors. So you already have a long cycle and low margins. And now you're not getting paid on time. They miss a payment run that you were expecting for payroll and kind of that last nail in the coffin. Not to mention we're seeing a lot of, you know, on the TPO side, really long review durations. I get a lot of phone calls about this. If you're a contractor and you're doing everything to get paid, you have all this money out for that job. It's been 90 days. And then you submit at mechanical completion and you get rejected and it took them 10 days to review it or 20 days to review it. That's another, you got to go fix it, maybe roll a truck and then put it back in the review. It could be another month before you get paid. And you know, I think that's a very real issue right now. And, and that's one that I think that, that Jason and I are aligned that we're trying to solve, right? And I think a lot of this can be solved through tech. We look at, at Sunrays when we're looking at a review of a system is... Okay, 40% of our jobs get rejected for shading. It's somewhere around that number. It's pretty close, which is sounds wild, right? But that's the case. And a lot of design tools are only as good, not every design tool is only as good as the underlying imagery that's used. And I use this anecdote all the time. I've seen every design tool on the planet at this point. And when people come and demo us, I'm like, all right, cool, pull up my house. I live in Florida. I live north of Orlando. I'm not in the middle of nowhere. It does not come up. I don't care how accurate your design tool is. You don't even know if I have a neighbor that's house is taller than mine. If I have trees, like it's all based on that underlying LIDAR and you don't know how old that is. So 
How can we get the biggest issue with that, by the way, it's still subjective because now you have a sales rep and you're arguing with them whether there's a tree there or not, or if the tree's 60 feet or 50 feet tall. So that's really what I like about what Jason has built. One, I think the industry needs standardization, just period, across all these different tools and platforms and things required to submit. This one requires this, this one requires that. I'm not saying everyone has to be identical, but I think there should be a baseline standard for every solar project that every lender, no matter what it is, meets these minimum criteria to make sure the customer is getting what they're signing up for. It's one of the only industries there's no QC. Imagine buying a car and there's no quality control from Ford. The wheels might fall off as soon as you take it off the lot, but you won't know until you get it home. That's basically where we're at. That's how I view it. So what we look for is how can we make sure we have quality projects, but instead of just throwing more reviewers at it, increasing durations, how can we use tech to solve problems? So we look at it, you know, we have a pie chart. Okay, 40% of our projects get rejected for shading. That's 80% of all rejections say, well, how can we fix that? How can we make it not subjective? How can we guarantee what is there is there? It's partnering with companies like Scanifly who have the imagery and it's real-time data. Oh, and by the way, it's going to give you a more accurate site survey anyway. So you might as well use it for the shade piece. It's just easy for a contractor. Now we don't have to look at those at those shade reports really at all, because I'm not going to argue with the imagery that the drone is accurate, Jason, to what? Within an inch, within an inch or two. Exactly. What's on site. It takes the human subjectivity out of the equation. And we all know it. a sales rep might want to push a max fill or fudge a tree of heights of trees, right? And so there's some real tension on the sales side. And then, you know, this is not Nate's organization, but there are some finance companies that are incentivized to take longer or maybe not to be a partner. Right. And I think what we admire most about Sunrays is they want to be a partner. First of all, they're from the industry. They've got people on staff from the industry. They've got electrical engineers they speak to. They've got like one day SLAs. Right. They are open with why they've rejected something and they coach you on how to not reject it next time. They don't want the friction. And I think going back to Nate's point, Sunrays is trying to elevate a degree of standardization using Scanoffly tech and the tech that they're building in house with their awesome team. And I think that's what will bring us into the era of quality as an industry. I'd love to actually tell a quick story on an interaction that I had related to this, if you don't mind, Benoit. No, um, that's great. Stories are great. So we were pitching a contractor who is now out of business. You'll understand kind of why I'm not surprised, unfortunately. You're always very sensitive with people, you know, jobs and stuff, but not surprised at all, right? So we were pitching them on integrating drones and their surveyors, their boss told me that their surveyors were going on the roof and getting hand measurements. He said, I want you to compare the accuracy of your drone modeling and your photogrammetry and your design process and your shading process with the accuracy of my team. No problem. Send me your preliminary designs where you started with your salesperson. Send me your site survey mock-ups. Send me your final designs and then what you built. And the amount of revisions that occurred were astronomical. All of the sites had revisions, all of them. There were at least three to five vent pipes missed. The shading had a 10% delta. And when I asked the surveyors, because we were trying to encourage them to use drones instead, I said, so what's your process like? Oh, we don't get on the roof. We just fill out a Google Maps and we hand it back. So there's a disconnect between the executive level and what happens in the field. And I actually experienced that at multiple companies. And I said to the surveyor, well, why aren't you on the roof? And he goes, I'm not getting on a third story roof, fill in your Sunbelt state. I'm really trying to be mindful of the individuals in the company, fill in your Sunbelt state, right? In June, on the fourth site of my day, do you want to be on that roof by myself? And I'm not even going to describe all the other implications, right? So when I look at a company, like there are several issues that we saw here, right? You know, first was the disconnect between what executives think are happening. I even told the executive, I said, this is what's going on at your business. He says, I don't believe your data. It's your team's data. They gave me the data. It's your, I don't believe it. Rerun it. I go, but let's talk about your guy not getting on the roof. Goes, I get on the roof. I can do it. I've been doing it for 15 years that way. But your team's not getting on the roof, right? So I don't blame one role, honestly, right? We have a systematic problem. There's a workflow problem. There's a transparency problem. And to Nate's point, there's a standardization problem. And the irony was, is the sales rep who sold it had to go through four site survey experiences. The fourth being the drone that we were like, yeah, do it for free. Try it out. That solved everything. The three others were all additional truck rolls. And so this is where sales reps think they're immune from ops. No, 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 no. Successful ops drives your next sale. Well, yes. And it drives, to Nate's point, your M2 payment and your M3 payment. When they went bankrupt, 
I was not surprised. I felt awful for them because I knew that all of the people that were rank and file wanted our technology and the executives didn't let it, right? So it's not pointing fingers in any direction, but we have a process problem. We have an ownership problem. We have a stakeholder problem. We have a standardization problem. Again, I'm really hopeful that with technologies like what Nick's company is putting together and what we're putting together, what we're doing as a partnership, we can solve that problem. Because the story I just told you is happening at like 80% of contractors right now, okay? We don't have the biggest market share yet. We are getting there. But I was on a call two weeks ago and the guy was, I don't know if it's a good time to use your technology. Okay, so how long are your site surveys? Oh, about two hours. Oh, what are you doing for two hours? We're chalking out the roof. Why is your surveyor pretending to be a designer? Okay, so what's your design process? Like, oh, we're remodeling the entire thing by scratch and cat ourselves. So you're spending an extra couple of days and you're getting bad data? So again, I think as we move into this next stage of this industry's life, that's when I'm hoping people, the light bulb will start flipping on and say, we want to work with finance companies that are our partners, not just money and searching for pricing and margin, right? Like we're working with people who are our partners and we're thinking about doing it in the right way. And if we can accomplish that, that's where this industry can really become a mainstay. And I think we'll see everyone benefit from going so. That is so huge. And I appreciate you bringing real world examples, you know, and you mentioned some of this sort of cowboy industry, but I think you're right. As the industry is maturing, it's all about like partnerships and partnerships with like-minded people and putting these standards in place and making things more efficient is the way to go. And that's how you're going to scale. And that's going to create like a competitive barrier to entry, I believe, and get the weak players out. And as we've seen, Obviously, two residential solar companies recently have gotten out of business in them. I wouldn't be surprised if we see more this year. That's really great. You know, Jason would be great. We have like a large, like a lot of different users or listeners. It would be great if you could talk about like how you use the drones on the roofs to basically create better designs. Briefly mention that in the intro, but if you could go into more detail, I think it would be helpful for the people who might not sure. know that much. I'll zoom out half a step and I'll just drones fit in about a couple of different places for a solar project, right? Most commonly used, you've got your hero shots for marketing. Put it on your website, make someone feel good. Here's the finished project. Very simple. Most solar contractors have a marketing rep with a drone collecting dust on their shelf that they pull out like twice. The drone is there. <laughs> you know, you can use it for more than the once a year marketing shot, right? The other very common understanding is thermal. That's more commonly seen for utility scale projects to detect hot spots and electrical infrastructure that might be having challenges. That's another use case that's commonly understood and seen as a great use case. And similar to that, you've got kind of your construction progress reporting shots. Again, also more utility scale focused. Less known and I think incredibly valuable is where Scanify's bread and butter is. It's on the survey side. So again, just to extrapolate on the workflow, you know, most contractors are dealing with bad satellite imagery, as Nate said. You've got outdated LIDAR. A lot of software companies hide the date of the LIDAR. We put it right in front and center. Here's the LIDAR date. Here's the Google date. Here's your drone date. So you know what data sources you're using. But typically, it's outdated LIDAR. You're dealing with skewed satellite imagery, blurry satellite imagery, new construction, so no satellite imagery. right? So you're dealing with remote data that best informs an economic conversation with a homeowner, but it doesn't get you anywhere near to install-ready designs. And so as a result... 90% of you know DG Solar will go on site to collect data before install day, right? Even if you feel like your satellite imagery is amazing, which a lot of contractors are convinced it is, and especially with AI coming out and everyone's obsessed with the next shiny thing, right? It's really, again, all just an estimate, right? Still, people are going to the site to collect technical data because you got to figure out what electrical system they have. Can the roof support the array from a structural perspective? Right? Am I going to need a main service panel upgrade, which is a, a multi-thousand dollar change order if you don't plan for it? So someone technical is going on site, whether you are collecting roof data or not. And our philosophy is, if someone's going on site, regardless of getting roof data or not, fly the drone. Get the most updated real-time site data. Now, what does that process entail and what do I mean by fly the drone? So you know, the vast majority of the industry still collects data the caveman style. Right? I'm going to climb up my ladder. I'm going to take out my pad and paper. I'm going to throw a tape measure across a ridge, maybe down to the valley, right? Maybe some of the obstructions, and I'm going to write it down on my pad and paper. I'm going to go to the next roof. Yeah. Most people only do the roofs that the sales reps tell them to do. So if anything changes, they have to go back or they make it up as they go. What about if you expand the system, right? So typically people are spending on average between 30 and 60 minutes 
per manual measurement. If it's sub 30 minutes, you know they're cutting major corners. And again, based on the story that I had told earlier, like no one wants to be on the roof in a lot of the climate that we're now experiencing around the year, right? Like people are pushing you to do two, three, four, five sites a day. Have you ever been on a roof in Texas or Arizona six months of the year, let alone you're not your first site, your second or your third, right? Or have you been on a roof in Minnesota in February or Iowa in January or Maine in December? Like that's not realistic to get good data. And so we have seen that three quarters of surveyors never actually feel safe in doing their jobs, right? We have seen that as a result of getting bad data in the field because of manual practices, that you know, roughly half of contractors experience revisions at least 25% of the time. Mm-hmm. And so where drones come in is they say, okay, let's get the guy off the roof from collecting measurements or the girl, right? And instead fly the drone and it takes just five to seven minutes on a residential property, maybe 15 to 20 on a commercial. It's fully automated. Click a couple buttons and say, go fly, take anywhere from 100 to 200 to 300 photos, typically in a circular pattern. So you get images from all the different angles and from above the trees and above the roof. So you're getting great oblique angles, but you're getting the entire scene. And now you have documentation of the entire property in a couple of minutes. And what makes ScanFly unique is that we have what's called a photogrammetry engine, which takes all of those drone photos, which are geotagged, and it automatically stitches them together to make a virtual replica photorealistic 3D model of the property, right? Most of our industry, when they think of 3D modeling, they think of like an extruded image off of a satellite tile. We're gonna lift the roof up by 12 feet because we think it's 12 feet and we're gonna make that little poke at the top because it's a gable. Like, oh, and we think that tree is 60 feet because we really trust Street View from five years ago. That's definitely Mm. accurate, right? No, 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 no. 3D Mm. modeling at its best uses real-time on-site data from a photogrammetry process from a drone. And we do that automatically. We're the only software that uses that technology, and it's in-house for us, that uses that technology, that reality capture technology to recreate a 3D scene and then layer on top of it a whole suite of design tools, including shading analysis tools that are approved by all the major regulators and lenders. And so for us, the drone will save you up to 90% of your time getting site data, especially in a commercial property. You're going to eliminate all of those revisions and change orders that occur on install day. And all we're doing is saying to a contractor, hey, maybe let's start thinking about the safety of the surveyor first and the efficiency of your workflow second and getting good data and what that means. And then what that will mean for your finance partner, because they're not rejecting 40% of your jobs anymore. You're getting your payments faster. You're getting your sales commissions faster by just doing a slight change to your tech process. Do you mean to tell me that trees aren't perfect circles and cones? We like to joke that uh, <laughs> solar contractors are playing Candyland all day with the way they model their trees, given some of the software is being used. Yes, their lollipop trees are not those heights. And if they grow, they're not those heights. Certainly not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just actually, uh, it's tongue in cheek, obviously, but I wanted to piggyback on that. So one of the issues too that I see in what we want to solve on our end with Sunrays is that it particularly in the third party ownership in the lease world, like the contractor is not financially aligned with the fund, whoever owns the lease. I think that's a key element of what we're trying to solve for. We're trying to create leases where the contractor retains equity in that project. Because when you talk about having so many rejections for shading and that they're subjective, meaning all three of us could look at a tree and it's different, or you could have different LIDAR than I do. And Benoit is telling me the tree's cut down because he has newer version of Google imagery or whatever it is. And this happens, I'm not kidding, all the time. Now, if you're not financially aligned, right, then the sales reps is going to be saying, this lease company is just trying to cut my commission. And that's the perception, but it's really not real. I mean, I would say the lease company just wants accuracy, right? They underwrite production. They don't benefit. Like I don't benefit if the system overproduces. The customer does a little bit, sure. And that's fine, but I don't make more money. I'm just trying to get accurate. I'm trying to get a fund that is going to produce 100% of what I tell my funding partners it's going to produce, whether adjusted, right? So- It's the subjectivity that creates more friction. I think anyone will say, and and what we're, the thesis we're proving right now is like, hey, Mr. Sales Rep, we're going to fly a drone. You can put in whatever shading and loss factors on the front end. You know, we give them the loss factors, but you can put in, you know, do the shading yourself and you can submit that and you'll get a price back, but that price is going to get trued up. It's either going to go up or down depending on how conservative you are. 
based on what the drone says, because you can't argue with it. And it's that particular friction point I'm trying to remove. Obviously, you know, once we get to the point and it's coming now with the new rules that we created, and I talked about that on the last episode. So anyone who wants to learn more about it, they can go check that out. But, you know, if we can give equity to the installer, I think that still aligns interest. But guess what? The sales are oftentimes separate from the installer. So you still have that friction, that issue. And so far, every installer I've talked to, and a lot of ours, by the way, Benoy, we're using Scanfly anyway for their site survey. We're like, let's just click on the shade tool. And now we don't have to review it. There's no subjectivity and none of them have a problem with it. Their price automatically getting trued up to reflect what's there. Because I truly believe that they just want to be accurate as well. But again, because there's financial misalignment, it's like sort of like prisoner dilemma in some way. It's easy to assume the other person has ill intent. And at the end of the day, everyone just wants accuracy, including the customer, by the way. Like I wanted to produce what you told me it was going to produce as a customer. That's what I want. If I'm paying a lease payment based on 10,000 kilowatt hours a year, I want 10,000 kilowatt hours a year, period. Yeah. I mean, there's so much to unpack from this, but yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see how the industry adapts and ones that are, you know, creating standards and adding value and making things easier for the customer is going to win at the end of the day. And that's interesting for Scanify, like the two things that you're focusing on for your customer. So one of the things I was going to ask is, I don't know, Nate, do you want to talk about transferability or no? I mean, we, we could do a whole another episode on that. I think we already talked about that a lot. What Ben always referring to is transferability of tax credits. Like back in, you know, for the last 10 years or so, the main barrier to entry of any solar project is getting tax equity to monetize the 30% or plus because there's adders now, but the 30% federal investment tax credit. And that's what we're leveraging that structure that was created by the Inflation Reduction Act to give equity back to installers, which otherwise would not really be possible in the old structure where you had to partner with a bank to monetize that tax and the bank owns the system for five years and it's a deep, dark rabbit hole. So let's save that one for another episode. I, I really want to focus on, on just, yeah, process quality, how Jason and I are in it every day. We have a front row seat. I mean, I think we both worked with, I've worked at multiple companies that have touched or serviced in some way, whether it's on the finance side, the software side, a lot of these companies that are going out of business, because there are a lot, I can name more, but it's not necessary. Everyone in the industry knows who they are. And I think really the message is like, there are, you see consistently companies that raise the bar and they have good PL and a strong balance sheet. And what are they doing differently? I think this is one of the things they're doing differently. It's really, you're going to that reviews matter. Like, I don't care who you are. Everyone's got a you know a phone, a, a laptop. They are going to Google both your company, the sales org, the finance party as soon as you leave. Again, I think that's one of the issues in the industry. Like when you look at just all the negative press that these public solar companies on the finance side have, have been getting, that leads to a really high cancellation rate. I think people are shocked how high the cancellation rate is in solar. I mean, historically, you know, what I see in the data through our platform over the last 10 years, it could be 40 plus percent. Some sales were even higher. That's a massive cancellation rate. And a lot of times it will come down to at least, you know, what I'm told and what we see is they trust the, the installer. Maybe the installer has a really good reputation, high quality standards, good reviews. And then they Google the finance party and they see a Times article or article in Forbes or F in the BBB. And like, I can't do a 25 year contract with this company, right? So we are looking to, you know, through that equity, have the installer can have their ABC solar, it can be ABC finance. You get that one seamless sure. brand experience the whole way through. I just think a lot of these things we're talking about are just building the case. Like how do we get consumer confidence up in solar? Because just think, I mean, there's not that much penetration. I usually have all the numbers in front of me. I think it's what, 3% in, across the country, which is largely buoyed by California. 3% of residential homes, something like that, that are eligible have solar. And obviously there's a long way to go before we even get to that early majority we cross the chasm, so to speak. And you know, why aren't we getting there? We've seen this slowdown. And I think there's a variety of reasons. Again, installers going out of business, interest rates, 
in inflation, but I think there's a lack of consumer confidence as well. I really do. You get through the early adopters, right? They're going to get it even if they have to pay more because it's cool. Like the first person who bought the $20,000 plasma TV. And how do we get the consumer's confidence back? I don't know. I've never had the privilege of being a customer without understanding solar, right? But I know if a contractor comes and they're like, Hey, you don't even have to be home. We're going to do your site survey. And they drop a drone on my porch and it just goes up and starts taking images of my house. And I get this cool 3D model. I'll be like, man, that's pretty cool. Right. And it's super realistic because I would encourage people to go check it out online, how neat it looks. I think it's the first step again, like reviews are going to be critical in the future, quality. And, and this is a step in the right direction. If you can shrink durations, that's also key because guess what? Customers get upset. When there's glass on the roof and the project hasn't hit PTO or been submitted to PTO for 30 days, 60 days, because you failed an inspection, you measured the roof wrong and you didn't have the right setback. I mean, there's a hundred things that can happen. It's an awful customer experience. And I think Jason alluded to it, but I also don't think most people, even within industry, appreciate the amount of change orders. I think almost every single job has a change order on it. Like even if you do everything perfect, you can show up that day and the customer's like, oh, you're going to put them there. You showed them the image. It's like, ah, my wife doesn't want them there. My husband doesn't want them on the garage or whatever. I mean, there's just so many reasons. Or you get out there and like Jason said, like, oh, you need an MPU. We never checked. It's like, that's not a small cost. That's, you know, something else that you have to wrangle with. And these are all very common things within the industry. And I think, that it's one of those, well, like I said, contractors are, they run a tight operation, relatively low margin. It's like, they don't want to add a cost, but they're not thinking about all the savings that they're going to get downstream, the faster cycle time to get paid faster, the less rejections, less running back to get another measurement, another truck roll, higher customer satisfaction, right? Because it was a faster duration. There's substantial costs that are end up going to be saved in the long run. And you just have to have that mentality as a business owner. You know, I always use the phrase that, you know, a lot of people are just stepping over dollars to pick up dimes. In this case, I think that's what it comes down to. It's like, I'm going to use the free tool online because it's free, you know, and and you see where that leads, right? There's a reason it's free. We were speaking to another leasing company recently, and we were trying to explain to them the value. And the value of doing the process the right way, not just Scanify, but just in general. And ultimately, they said their process is accurate enough. And when we analyzed the underlying data, it was very clear that projects using our technology are going to be between minimum 5 and 10% more accurate when it comes to production and shading. And the worse the shading scene is, the bigger the delta. Okay. And the response to me was, you know our investors, the institutional investors, right? The GPs on their fund. And I said, yeah, sure. That's who you should talk to because then we'll change our standards. I actually do think that the finance industry, and I'll I'll broaden a bit, might not truly understand the nitty gritty of the ops side. I think that's one of the things I admire most about Sunrays is not only do they do understand it, they care to understand it and they care to partner with contractors so both are successful and frictionless. But in trying to get in front of other finance companies to at least just introduce ourselves, right? Our partner is with Sunrise. That's our first foray into this area for us. But to at least introduce the idea, to help level up the industry, they just don't understand. I remember talking to a business development rep at one of the major finance lenders, and I explained to him what we were doing. And he, he was like, I don't understand. Like, I have my remote imagery. Isn't that the same thing as what you're talking about? Like, genuinely, you know, we were pitching one of the publicly traded finance companies. And they even knew that we were more accurate. And they're like, yeah, we have our process. I just don't think they care right now. And when we go back to standardization, we talk about accountability, we talk about having our industry mature. The finance companies, I hope, are going to follow Nate and his team's leadership and come into this new decade of solar because there's going to continue to be not the best actors on the contractor side. Like that's just inevitable. There's always a spectrum. There's a gradient within business. And the ones that aren't great will go bankrupt and they'll come back. And especially the long term, like it can be a fickle industry. It's a low margin business. It's it's a challenging business. But we have only a select number of financial companies that everyone looks to right now. And I think I just love to hope that they get together and they truly understand what where the problems lie and where it's hurting their businesses, whether it's a loan or a lease, because it's kind of obvious. And so it's now a matter of what are we going to do about it? Yeah. And look, 
Anyone, it's the first time I've ever heard that one. So anyone who says it's accurate enough, I know this isn't heart surgery here. We get that but, all the time, man. All the time. Accurate enough is good okay. enough. All the so time. from a consumer standpoint, this is why we're down, you know, the same quarter of last year. This is exactly it. This was how I started. This is my point. This is going to be, a, but imagine going to the gas station, paying for 10 gallons of gas and you get eight and a half. It's accurate enough. All right. That's not brain surgery. It's just energy, right? Customer signs up on a lease. Their average savings in the first year is 20%. You underperform by 15%. Now they're saving five. That's not okay for me. That's like, if I go anything that you buy in life, you go store and get milk, you get a half gallon of milk or a gallon of milk, right? It doesn't come with 90% less in it because when they were filling it, it was accurate enough. I mean, you could apply this to anything. Like I want to get as a consumer what I am paying for, especially if I'm buying it as most solar customers are predicated on saving money on energy. Sure, some people want to save the planet. Awesome. But let's be realistic. A lot of people are buying solar or being sold solar. They end up buying it because they want to save money. So if the average is 20% or 10% and you underproduce, then you're not giving them what they thought they were going to get. That is a problem. I fundamentally find that just as morally, ethically wrong. So to say accurate enough, I would challenge those folks in the future and be like, okay, where do you want to start? Like, so you're cool. Again, you go to the gas station and you're cool getting eight and a half gallons and you pay for 10 because they didn't measure it. You know, why do you think they have that thing on the pump that says when the last time that they checked it? for weights and measures. There's a reason for that, right? Because there's going to be incentive for, for companies to, how do you know? You don't, right? And it's the same when you first get your solar. You're trusting the expert, the sales rep and the installer that the, you're going to get what they told you you're going to get. And it's their job to deliver it. That's how I view it, period, end of discussion. So I think it's hysterical that somebody would say that. Every I could think day, of a million every things. Day, every day we get that. Yeah. Seriously, every day. We had a situation where a really, really reputable contractor that we love working with, you know, someone part of a network, I'm trying to be anonymous here. Basically, they were questioning production forecasted data versus what the as built and the live production data that we're getting was. And they were looking at their sales done on a remote imagery. They're looking at their final design in Scanapply. And they're like, why is Scanapply's production data wrong? was the starting point because they were ingrained in the remote imagery. This goes back to my commentary of the last decade was all about sales, remote imagery and, and LIDAR. Everyone thinks LIDAR is like the magic solution to the world, you know? And we actually got yelled at that we were not accurate. We were the incumbent. We were not the incumbent, excuse me. You know, we were new. It's not great. And then someone that we've worked with for many years said, look, why don't we just pull up the historical data? Next call, more people on it to lambast Scanapply's production to defend the remote imagery because it was a reputable platform from a reputable dealer network and Scanapply matched perfectly the historical production. Let's just follow the data, people. Let's yeah, I believe it. Data. Listen, like, I, I don't, don't think see we're going to be perfect every time. <laughs> like, again, we're not perfect every time, I told, but we will be better than your satellite and your sales imagery. Like, and the same for utility scale. I, I know, Benoit, a lot of your listeners are large scale project developers. So I'll, I'll give a quick anecdote for that audience. Like we did the same exact thing for a large portfolio in North Carolina. We looked at, I think it was 30 sites that were built during the early kind of, you know, partnership flip years of early, you know, North Carolina solar, right? Back in the day. And they're all built on brownfield sites. So all of them had trees surrounding the perimeter and they all grew. And so the production was definitely down five or 10% at a minimum for a lot of them. And we scanned all of them and we were easily able to uncover that the trees hanging over the perimeters because they're stringed you know, was causing the shading. And if you trim them back, it would have solved the problem. And we did an economic analysis of why you should trim them back and why you should get the fund back to performing where it should be. And when I asked for the independent engineering study, I finally got it. And I'm not going to say who it is, even though I want to, I asked for how you did shading and I looked at it and they did a blanket assumption that would look like a New Orleans levee around the property. And that was it. And I'm like, well, that's why your production's off by a minimum of 5% and your fund is underperforming. And that's utility scale solar. Right. So this problem in the financial company was like, cool, apparently accurate enough is good enough. Right. And again, as an industry, no matter what the size of the project is, when are we going to start leveling it up? Right. Yeah. You know, like this whole underperformance issue is an issue with a lot of solar assets. Right. You know, people obviously trying to I think it's KWH analytics 
trying to put the production but and obviously like without these standards that you're talking about and people just doing things haphazardly has created a lot of issues within the industry with a lack of production so it's great like i really appreciate you both like really bringing this issue to the forefront you know i think the only way because i think this has been honestly happening since the beginning is that I, first of all, I feel like you're right, Jason, that financiers probably don't appreciate. I was on that side of the house. I know that we just look for the PV cyst line and we look for the production line. It goes right into my model. Oh, yeah. I'm not saying one shop or another is better or worse. Again, I'm just generally speaking, this is a couple of years ago. You know, we all should get a better technical understanding of what happens. Oh, for sure. And that will make everything a lot better. Just having, you know, financiers who are just focused on the financial and just putting a number in a spreadsheet, but really understanding what could cause like an issue related to underproduction because obviously you rarely see overproduction, the opposite. And obviously that impacts the numbers and the returns. So I think everyone kind of un- taking a deeper understanding to everything. Also too, like, you know, Nate, obviously with Sunrise Capital with, you know, you guys doing things the right way, right? That you would think you would win a lot more business from doing it. And then you know, other companies are going to try to figure out what the secret sauce is. And part of it could be obviously doing things the right way and detailed. Not only is it more efficient, but if you're dealing with a fund that's, you know, 500 million, a billion dollars, they're going to care about 5%. I promise you that. And the contractor should too, because not only a, even if your funding partners want to continue after your first fund is underproducing by 5%, guess what they're going to do? they're really going to raise their return expectation to cover that loss. And it just means the contractor is going to get paid even less. So it impacts everyone. I have an anecdote to save for another episode, but we've been through this before on the shade side. And that's really what kicked it off with Jason and I years ago. And, you know, it's not even malicious. It's just, you know, all three of us could do a shade report manually and get different answers. Or it's not uncommon. Like one of the really common ones is a one-story house next to a two-story house. That two-story house could shade the entire system depending on the orientation and it never gets modeled. Like those are things that we got to look for. But again, with technology, you don't have to review it because the, the drone just takes care of it for you. Yeah, and I think as technology continues to advance, the software continues to advance obviously everyone likes to talk about ai but maybe like that creates those sort of standards and procedures right that the investors require that certain things are done you know yeah. to be approved so that's less diligence if they sell the if it's, especially if it's a c i've sold cni portfolios have done you know billions of dollars in the space in both resi and commercial like you guys and when you sell these portfolios which is inevitable what would you rather have i mean a you want it to be producing because that's the ultimate like yeah look we're right on target but yeah. if you can do that while reducing friction while getting higher accuracy like it's a no-brainer for, again, from the customer, from the installer, and the financier. It aligns everyone's interests. Everyone wants to be accurate. I've got two hot takes for you guys on trends that we're seeing contractors do to, to buck this trend. The first pins off of what you said, Nate, around recurring revenue that contractors don't have a lot of. I actually think that DG contractors, you know, resident commercial, are going to be doing a lot more proactive maintenance going forward. I think building preventative maintenance departments to not be cost zones, but revenue drivers is going to happen. We're slowly seeing it. I'm bullish on that as a long-term solution. I think too many sales reps are selling solar as maintenance-free. And then if you ask the contractor who stands behind a 20 to 25-year workmanship, they're just eating costs every step of the way. And what's unique right now is most good contractors aren't just selling solar. They're selling batteries. They're selling heat pumps. They're selling EVs. They're selling expanded systems as people electrify their homes more. And so what is starting out as just a PV installation actually could be many rounds of upselling. And would you rather have the relationship with the homeowner when they're calling you bitching that their solar doesn't work? Or would you rather it be a one-year $200 truck roll for a preventative maintenance check to clean up some leaves and squirrel guards and wiring and say, oh, by the way, we just got this new you know, EV charger that's going to be X, Y, and Z better. Any interest? Now Is now the right time? Are you going to go EV with your new vehicle? I, I see that car in the driveway is 10 years old. Maybe this is the right time. I think especially larger long tail and regional leading that have been around for a long time. Those contractors are already doing this and they're going to be turning maintenance into an ARR, recurring revenue stream, a great way to underpin their business, especially in the slower season and a way to stand out versus competition. The second theme that we're seeing 
is people doing the site survey at the point of closing. So this is, Nate alluded to that friction that occurs, right? People don't want to pay additional fees and roll a truck. You know, contractors don't want to pay to roll the technical truck roll until the contract is signed. But then you have this weird true up change order dynamic. And if you're a contractor who's taking financing, you're typically waiting to the M2 payment at inst- after installation. They got to hold on to all those costs. And if there's a delta, that could really affect cash flow. Instead, if you know that that person is leaning into the sale, maybe you selectively or holistically do the site survey at the point of closing. So there is no true up anymore at all, right? We've actually seen people grow their close rates by 20% by doing drone flights at the point of close. You are negating your true up in your change order. You're showing awesome imagery. You showcase yourself as tech forward. You're doing another truck roll, but it's building that relationship. And you're showing that you're a contractor who's going to last and be a partner to them. I have seen contractors that are now growing through this down cycle because they are doing more upfront, but the increase of close rates by a lot is way, way better than the marginal increase of fees of getting their survey to tack on one or two sites a day that are near closing. And I think both of these trends, you're going to see good contractors lean into more and and Scanify is here to help with that. And I know Nate's fund is also here to support that type of leveling up of quality and, and incentivize it as well. I love that. I think that's a great way to end unless I know you have any more questions. No, I mean, I think this has been a really great podcast. I appreciate both of you making the time. If our audience wants to learn more about Sunrays and Scanify, what's the best way for them to do that? Our website, we've got a short form to provide information, or you can feel free to email me directly, firstname.lastname at scanify.com. But either way, we'll get your information and be in touch within within a day or so. Awesome. Yeah. You can find me on LinkedIn. It's the best spot. It's where business happens in my world. So not as active as I was because I'm growing a business. It's taking a lot of my effort, but I still check it at least a few times a week. So it's always a good way to get a hold of me. Awesome. Well, this has been really a great podcast. I appreciate you both making the time and I'm sure we could do multiple podcasts on many different topics. And I look forward to doing that in the near future. And thank you both for your time. I think our audience will find it really useful. Thanks so much, Benoit. Thanks for having us. Thanks for listening to the Solar Maverick Podcast. The Solar Maverick Podcast is brought to you by Renew Energy. We're a solar development and consulting firm. If you believe that this podcast is adding value to you, please give us a five-star review and share with those that you think can benefit from this information. Please email all questions, suggestions, and feedback to info at renewenergy.com. That's I-N-F-O at R-E-N-E-U energy.com. The Solar Maverick podcast is produced by Podcast Laundry and executive produced by Benoit Thangin and Kevin Y. Brown. Solar Maverick.